the glorious might for all endurance and patience with joy. Giving thanks to the Father who has qualified you to share in the inheritance of the saints in light. He has delivered us from the dominion of darkness and transformed us to the kingdom of his beloved Son, in whom we have redemption and forgiveness of sins. He is the, many, he is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation. For by him all things were created in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities, all things were created through him and for him. And he is therefore all things in him, all things hold together. And he is the head of the body, the church. And he is the beginning of the firstborn from the dead, that everything he might, everything he might be preeminent. Amen. Dan? How's everyone this morning? What a blessing it is for me to be able to look out and see all of your beautiful smiling faces. You guys are stuck looking at me. Well, you don't have to look at me. You could follow along in your Bibles, which is much better than looking up here at me. The congregation always welcomes anybody visiting with us. If you feel that you are a visitor, we are truly blessed to have you with us here this morning, and we pray that our worship to God will be glorifying unto God and that it will be edifying to his church here this morning. Rod, thank you for the reading, not Galatians, but Colossians chapter 1. I'm going to be making three points this morning. The lesson is walk worthy of your calling. Walk worthy of your calling. I wasn't going to go here, but it just popped into my head. Let's look at 1 John quickly. 1 John chapter 1. Actually, I believe Rod used this as one of his proof texts this morning. And again, if you were not here at Bible study, Rod does a fantastic job going through the Word of God line for line. We are currently in the book of Romans, chapter 6, approximately verse 11 or 12-ish. So if you really want to get an in-depth study, I would encourage everybody to come out at 9.30 till 10.15, 10.20, 10.25. Kind of depends on how Rod wants to go. But it's at least till 10.15. Let's look at 1 John chapter 1. In verse number seven, but if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another and the blood of Jesus Christ, his son, cleanses us from all sin. We need to make sure that we are walking worthy. And if we aren't walking worthy of our calling, we certainly aren't walking in the light. And if we are not walking in the light, then the blood of Jesus Christ will not cleanse us from our sins. 
If you asked people in the world, what is the most important goal of life? What is the most important goal in life? We would get, I, I venture to say thousands of different responses. But there's only one correct answer. And that answer can be found in the book of Ecclesiastes, chapter 12 and verse number 13. Ecclesiastes chapter 12 and verse number 13. And, and this is after it was looked at under heaven at the vanity that man goes through. And the conclusion of the matter in verse 13 says, let us hear the conclusion of the whole matter. It's getting ready to be settled right here, right now. Fear God and keep his commandments, for this is man's all. We were created for one purpose, to fear God and keep his commandments, to glorify God. Everything else we do as his creation are peripheral things. They should be out here. Our focus needs to be like a laser on fearing God and keeping his commandments. The fear there is not a fear that, it's a reverent fear, let me put it that way. Knowing who God is, knowing that literally they spoke life into existence. Through the words they spoke, we are here. Man was created from the dust of the earth. I'm digging up weeds. I can't seem to get ahead of them as fast as I dig them up. They're, they're reproducing faster than I can get them up. But God took the dust of the earth and breathed into it and created man. Ladies, that's why your men are often dirty. We got grease, we got stuff under our nails because we're made of the dust of the earth. But you women were made from man. You were made with better things than we were made with. We were made with the dust of the earth. We sweep the dust, right, and we throw that out. But you ladies were made from man, literally out of man. So in our text this morning, and we're going to be in Colossians chapter 1, Paul makes the proposition that we must walk worthy. Well, if we must walk worthy, then there's another walk that is not worthy. We're not going to focus on that walk this morning. We're going to be focusing on the worthy walk of our calling to please God. We walk worthy to please God. What does Paul say about walking in a worthy manner? Does he have much to say on it? Well, through our reading this morning in Colossians chapter 1 verses 9 through 11, we need to uh, grow, point one, grow in knowledge. We have to grow in our knowledge. I would ask anything that you're interested in, you study it. You want to know more about it. You want to make sure that you have a great understanding of it. Um, as an example, um, if I ever needed heart surgery, and I pray I don't, I would pray that my heart surgeon is up to date, right, with the latest 
medical technology, that he's not using something that's outdated 40, 50, 70 years ago. The mechanic that works on my car when I mess it up trying to work on it myself. I pray that the mechanic is up to date with the latest engines. You open up the hood of your car now, you used to be able to see the engine. Now you see plastic, right? You try to get to a spark plug, they intentionally put it under something on the back end. You have to have a special tool that costs $8,000. <laughs> These things are intentional, I believe. But I want to make sure that the mechanic I have is up to date, that he's not working on a 1966 VW Bug when somebody pulls in in a Ferrari from 2024. They're both engines, but they don't operate the same. So we need to grow in our knowledge. If you have the same knowledge of the Word of God after 5, 10, 15, 20, 30 years, I'm going to stop at 30 years because I don't want anybody to get upset. If you have that same knowledge, that's not enough. We need to grow in our knowledge. In the book of Hosea, chapter 4 and verse number 6, I'm going to paraphrase it. You know what? I'm not going to paraphrase it. Let's turn to Hosea, chapter 4 and verse 6. And if you're flipping through, it's only a couple pages, so you might pass it up a couple times. Hosea chapter 4 and verse number 6. My people are destroyed for lack of knowledge. People are destroyed because of their lack of knowledge. Because you have rejected knowledge. I also will reject you from being priests for me. There are many people that reject knowledge. We've been going through the book of Proverbs. And... The book of Proverbs teaches us that wisdom is the principal thing. Therefore, get wisdom. And in all you're getting, get understanding. You could replace understanding with knowledge. There's a lot of people that will say to you, oh, I read my Bible. And I'm not arguing the case that they aren't reading their Bible. But there's a reading of the Bible, and there's a studying of the Bible. And they're not the same. It doesn't say read to show thyself approved. It says study to show thyself approved. We must gain knowledge. Let's go all the way back to 1 Chronicles. 1 Chronicles. And find out if knowledge makes any difference. Does it make any difference? Would knowledge have helped? I don't have time to read the entire chapter, chapter 13 of 1 Chronicles. But this is about the ark being brought back. Now, God had set a standard on how the ark was to be moved, who was allowed to move it, and when it could be moved. So we have here David. And David consulted, verse, the captains of thousands and hundreds, and with Every leader, and David said to all the assembly of Israel, if it seems good to you, 
And if the Lord our God let us send out to our brethren everywhere who are left in the land of Israel and with them to the priests and Levites who are in the cities and their common lands that they may gather together to us. And let us bring the ark of our God back to us. For we have not inquired at it since the days of Saul. That sounds like a great thing. Let's bring the ark back to us. Well, if you go down a little further, let's see. I'm going to go to verse number seven. So they carried the ark of God on a new cart from the house of Abinadab and Uzzah and Ahio drove the cart. Then David and all Israel played music before God with all their might, with singing and harps and stringed instruments, tambourines on cymbals and with the trumpets. And when they came to uh, Chidion's threshing floor, Uzzah put out his hand to hold the ark, for the oxen began to stumble. That's almost an automatic, I see something stumbling, I'm going to put my hand out. Does that seem like anything worthy of death? He's trying to keep the ark from falling on to the ground. Well, first, the ark was on a cart. Wasn't supposed to move with a cart. There were poles that needed to be put through and it needed to be carried a certain way. So because they refused to follow God's commands and they did it their way, Uzzah was struck dead for trying to keep the ark from falling. Verse number 10. Then the anger of the Lord was aroused against Uzzah, and he struck him because he put his hand on the ark, and he died there before God. We must increase our knowledge of the word of God. We can't continually nurse on the milk of the word. Sooner or later, you need to dig in and you need to get to the meat of the word. We need to continue to grow in our knowledge. There is a difference so let's look at Matthew chapter 4, Gospel of Matthew chapter 4. I've given an example before about driving. There was a young woman, I think she was about 16 or 17, and she was getting her license for the first time. And she was really worried about the driving part of the test. And I was telling her, I said, ask your parents to think back to when they were first learning to drive. Think back when you were first learning to drive. And every move you made, you had to think about before you did it. You're coming to a corner. How do I turn? How slow do I go? How close or far away from the curb? How many of you make those thoughts right now? Do you, when you get in your car to leave here, do you go, okay, I need to go this fast, I need, no. Why? Because you've acquired a knowledge of the vehicle you operate, you understand it. Let's look at Matthew 4 verses 1 through 11 really quick. We're not going to go through every verse. But this is the tempting of Jesus. And Satan would take scripture out of context. And he would rest that, trying to make it mean something that it didn't mean. 
Jesus' correction was always the proper understanding of the word of God. Jesus didn't tell him about feelings he had. Jesus didn't tell him about what the pastor said or what the priest said. He always referred back to the word of God. I'm going to read verse 3. Now, when the tempter came to him, he said, If you are the Son of God, command that these stones become bread. Why bread? 40 days. No food. I'd be hungry. I can't go four hours. In fact, I'm looking forward to the potluck. I'd like to thank everybody that is participating this morning. In fact, if you are our guest, Please don't rush out, there's plenty. So please stick around with us and, and let's enjoy a meal together. So Jesus replied to him, it is what I'm thinking. It is what I've heard others say. No, it is written. Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. Then the devil took him up into the holy city and set him on the pinnacle of the temple. If you are the son of God. Satan knew he was the son of God or else he wouldn't have been tempting him. But he's asking him anyway. And then Jesus responds in verse seven. It is written again, you shall not tempt the Lord thy God. And then he tempts him again. And Jesus' response is, look away with you. For it is written. It is written. Our feelings can be deceived. Our emotions can be deceived. Our thoughts can be deceived. But if you go to the word of God, it is always true. It is always right. There is not one word in here that conflicts with any other word. Even though man would tell you, well, how does this fit with that? Because they don't study. They don't understand the word. They're like Satan. They think that they found something that can't be answered. Point number two, we need to remember what our Lord has done. Let's look back at Colossians chapter 1, verses 12 through 14. Colossians 1, 12 through 14. Giving thanks to the Father who has qualified us to be partakers of the inheritance of the saints in the light. He has delivered us from the power of darkness and conveyed or transferred or transported us into the kingdom of the son of his love. Jesus Christ set mankind free if mankind obeys him. We're not free just because. We're free if we obey his teachings. If you've yet to obey his teaching, you're a slave of the evil one. You're a slave of sin. I'm a slave, and those of us that have obeyed the gospel are slaves. But we're slaves of righteousness. And there is a difference. We're all slaves, but we're not all slaves of righteousness. What about the example of Israel? Let's look at Deuteronomy chapter 8. Deuteronomy chapter 8. I'm going to begin in verse 11. Beware, 
there that you do not forget the Lord your God by not keeping his commandments, his judgments, and his statutes, which I command you today. Lest when you have eaten and are full and have built beautiful houses and dwell in them, and when your herds and your flocks multiply and your silver, your gold are multiplied and all that you have is multiplied, when your heart is lifted up and you forget the Lord your God who brought you out of the land of Egypt from the house of bondage, who led you through the great and terrible wilderness in which, <coughs> excuse me, were fiery serpents, scorpions, and thirsty lands where there was no water, who brought you water for you out of a flinty rock, who fed you in the wilderness with manna, which your fathers did not know, that he might humble you and that he might test you to do good in the end. Then you say in your heart, my power and the might of my hand have gained me this wealth. And you shall remember the Lord your God, for it is he who gives you power to get wealth, that he may establish his covenant, which he swore to your fathers as it is this day. Then it shall be, if you, by any means, forget the Lord your God and follow other gods and serve them and worship them, I testify against you this day that you shall surely perish. As the nations which the Lord destroys before you, so you shall perish because you would not be obedient to the voice of of the Lord your God. We just partook of the Lord's Supper. Two simple emblems, unleavened bread that represents his body and the fruit of the vine which represents his blood. The Bible commands that we do this upon each first day of the week. Yet most in the world that are quote unquote believers don't partake of the Lord's Supper each first day of the week. It is a reminder to us of what he did. So if we're not remembering it, but maybe once a year, every couple of months, how's that a reminder? We need to remember what our Lord has done for us. Why do we need to remember? Why remember? I mean, those things are in the past, right? We don't, we don't need to remember. I don't look in my rear view mirror when I'm driving. Well, sometimes, because our patrol's back there. But when I'm driving, I look through my windshield. I don't look back. We need to look back. So that we have an understanding. Let's look at Romans chapter 6 where we're with Rod. We're going to look at verse number 20. Romans chapter 6. Verse number 20 through 23. And having been set free from sin. You became slaves of righteousness. I speak in human terms because of the weakness of your flesh. For just as you presented your members as slaves of uncleanliness and of lawlessness leading to more lawlessness, so now present your members as slaves of righteousness for holiness. For when you, we, were slaves of sin, we were free in regard to righteousness. We're not free anymore. We think back, we ought to be thinking back, and we should have no desire to return to sin. 
but the flesh is weak. And we do sin from time to time as Christians. And again, it ties into the lesson this morning that Rob was teaching that we have in 1 John the ability when we sin to go to him and confess those sins to him and those sins will be forgiven. There's this old saying, sin will take you farther than you want to go. It'll keep you longer than you want to stay. And it will cost you more than you want to pay. Let me say that again. Sin will take you farther than you want to go. I'll just try it this one time. Just one time. I'm going to try it one time. Now you know you're a drug addict. You've been on the street 15 years. It'll keep you longer than you want to get there. When I was a little boy, we'd go to the beach and you try digging the sand. Have you guys noticed the sand just keeps, you're digging it out and almost as fast as you're digging the hole, the sand's going back into the hole. Sin doesn't want to let you out. Once Satan has his hands on you, he does not want to let go. But in the Gospels, it says that nothing can pluck us out of God's hands. You want safety? You want security? Get in God's hands. And then nobody. Now, you could leave, but nobody can take you out. You can voluntarily leave, and, and sadly, many people have, and many people will, and many people do. And I just imagine on that day of judgment, the Bible says it would have been better for them if they never knew than to have known and go back. We need to point three, recognize the preeminence of Christ. Going back to Colossians chapter one, verses 15 through 18. I'm going to read where it says he, I'm going to say Jesus, because it's referring to Jesus. Jesus is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn over all creation. For by Jesus, all things were created that are in heaven and that are on earth, visible and invisible whether thrones or dominions or principalities or powers, all things were created through Jesus and for Jesus. And Jesus is before all things. And in Jesus, all things consist. And Jesus is the head of the body, the church, who is the beginning of the firstborn from the dead, that in all things, Jesus may have the preeminence. Again, Rod didn't call me up. I didn't call Rod. But again, Rod brought up in his lesson the raising of the dead. Right? Jesus rose people from the dead. The apostles raised people from the dead. Why is Jesus' resurrection from the dead different? Because he was raised from the dead never to die again. Those others that were raised died. Jesus Christ was the firstborn from the dead. We as believers, when we obeyed him in baptism, we died to our old man. We were raised up a new person in Christ Jesus. Oh, I encourage you to be here with Rod on Sunday mornings. Christ had power over nature. 
power over nature. In Matthew 8, 23 through 27, we have him calming the sea through his words. I've spoke to water all the time. It doesn't pay any attention to me. I don't know how the water understands him, but he is, he is every, it's still amazing to me. He calms the sea by speaking to it. The power of voice only belongs to deity. What about Jesus raised the dead by calling on them? He didn't touch them. He called on them. You can see this in Luke chapter 7 and verse 14. You can see another example in John chapter 11 and verse 43. Lazarus, arise. He didn't touch him. What about his followers? His followers were hands on. In Acts 20 and verse 10, it says that Paul fell on him and embraced him. And he was raised. Elijah stretched over him three times. You can find that in 1 Kings 17 and verse 21. And then Elisa stretched over him. And that's in 2 Kings 4 verses 34 and 35. We need to recognize point three ending. We need to recognize Jesus' preeminence over his church. Singular. I'm not an artist, but if you have more than one head on a body, it's an abomination. If you have more bodies under one head, it's an abomination. We have one head. We have one body. Jesus is the head. The church is his body. Jesus has all authority. Matthew 28 and verse 18. Let's look at that really quick. Matthew 28 and 18. All authority has been given me. Go therefore and make disciples of all the nations. That is the church's mission, to go and make disciples, baptizing them in the name of, that means by the authority of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all things that I have commanded you, and lo, I am with you always to the end of the age. Jesus is the firstborn of the dead. He is uh, the first to die, to be raised, and never die again. One more passage, Hebrews chapter 7, verses 23 through 25. Hebrews chapter 7, verses 23 through 25. Also, there were I'm sorry. Also, there were many priests because they were prevented by death from continuing. But he, or but Jesus, because he continues forever, has an unchangeable priesthood. Therefore, he is also able to save to the uttermost 
those who come to God through him since he always lives to make intercession for them. We come to God through Jesus Christ. There is no other access to the Father except through Jesus Christ. Because of Christ, we have freedom from sin and the fear of death. What can death do to me? Death, where is your sting? What's, what's the very worst thing that humanity can do to somebody? They would say kill you. Okay, thank you. Just got me there a little bit faster. Our desire as Christians should always be to walk worthy of the calling so that it may please the Lord. When we are out in the world and we are walking, the world is paying attention. You might not think that your neighbor is paying attention. You might not think that your coworkers are paying attention. You might not think that your children or grandchildren are paying attention because you've talked to them. They're watching what you do. They might not be listening to what you're saying because if your walk doesn't represent your talk, they're going to pay attention to the walk. You could tell them all the right things and do all the wrong things. If there's anyone here who wants to join us in this walk, a worthy walk, a walk that will get us an eternity in heaven with the Father, where Jesus himself has went to prepare a place for us, where the Holy Spirit on that day that Jesus returns is somehow going to change this body into a body that can be in the physical presence of our Lord and Savior, now is the acceptable time of salvation. We read about being in Christ. There's only one way to be in Christ. The Bible says that as many of us as were baptized into Christ have put on Christ. You need to hear the word. You need to believe the word. You need to uh, repent of your sins and confess Christ before men. And you could do all those things and not be saved until you obey him in baptism, you will be lost in your sins because we come into contact with his cleansing blood through baptism. If there's anyone here this morning that wants to obey or needs the help of the church, please come forward as we stand and sing. Would you be free from the burden of sin? There's power in the 